show. We're live from Anchorage at the Lakefront Hotel. My name is Joe Runyon, Danny Seavey, our guest today, Paul Gebhardt. And for reasons I'll disclose in a moment, Paul Gebhardt is one of my favorite mushers. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for joining us, Paul. And I'm not sure how to, how to follow that one there. But um, now you live down by us on the Kenai Peninsula, um, south of Anchorage here. And I know my dad has had a very hard time getting trained this year. There's no snow at all in our area. How has that been for you? Were you able to train at home, or how did you get your dog team prepared for this? Well, early in the season, we did get a little bit of snow, so we had several of our earlier runs after yeah. we got off the four-wheeler training yeah. um, <clears throat> that we could run on snowmobiles and a couple sleds. Rides. And by running on snow machine, you mean actually hooking the dogs to the snow machine Correct. for I, added control? I yeah. do quite a bit of my training with the, with the, the dogs actually pulling the snowmo yeah. snowmobile itself because... Uh, out of necessity, I've, I've only got one guy that's handling for me, yeah. and he's doing a good job, but we train a lot of dogs, so I run big teams, and the only way to control them is with some kind of mechanical device. I've seen you with some big teams, so how many dogs do you hook up with a, to a snow machine? Um, this year, the largest team I hooked up was like 30 dogs. To one snow machine? To one snowmobile, and they'll that's, pull that's, it anywhere they want to go. The, they, you, in other words, they can pull it. They can pull it, <laughs> and they have pulled it even with the groomer behind it. Um, so, it, yeah. I have control over them as long as they know I'm doing something. They watch me, and then the leaders will look back. And uh, when I start walking by a snowmobile, I better be ready to grab it. Because so. it'll start skidding down the it trail. It goes down the trail with the brakes on or whatever. It doesn't matter. 30 dogs is a lot of power. Yeah. I'd love to know what the horsepower equivalent is to, it, to it 30 would dogs. It be very interesting to figure out a formula to, to you know, diverse that. Compare from, that, yeah. From horsepower to dog power because they can... They can move a lot of stuff. Especially on ice and snow, because they have so much better traction a lot of times than the brakes do on a snow machine, right? If you're on very slim snow, that snow machine brake doesn't do a whole lot. Whereas Correct. And once they break it loose, and that's what they're good at, and uh, it's yeah. actually fun to watch them because they learn, to, and I don't know what their communication is, but they learn <laughs> that they all have to jerk at one time and they break <laughs> it loose, and once it's broke loose, they can go anywhere they want. <laughs> <laughs> so, Danny, uh, explain. You did some analysis. Paul Gebhardt, has one of the most successful uh, race careers for a person that hasn't won. Tell, tell us about it. Well, absolutely. This is your is your 20th Iditarod now? It's if the 20th I'm one, yeah. Straight? I did scratch one time. Okay, but that's still 20 Iditarods, and you finished 19 of them, and you've been second twice and third. I mean, you've yeah, had some. Second twice, third, fifth, sixth, ninth. You've, yeah, you've yeah. been right there a, a lot of times over the years, but... You've also been down as far as mid-20s in the last 10 years or whatever. I wanted to ask you, what do you feel is the difference between a, a 20th place run or a 10th place run or a second place run? Because sometimes you look at the standings and it seems like it's all kind of right there. But what I know perhaps in some people's cases they're not able to get as trained as much in a year or <clears throat> ebbs and flows of a dog team. What's, what's the difference between a 20th place and a second place? There is a tremendous amount of things that can happen in a dog race yeah. uh, that can alter where you end up finishing. Yeah. <clears throat> you, you know, someone that finishes in 25th place might actually have a top 10 team, but he oh, had yeah. a bad run. Yeah. There's a lot of luck and different circumstances that evolve in that. I feel that training has a lot to do with it. The quality of training, not so much the miles, but the quality of miles you get to put on the dog yeah. team. You know, uh, in the last couple of years, other than, and this year we, we've had to travel some too, but if you travel with the dogs in the dog box a lot, the dog boxes are smaller than their regular house, yeah. so they, they're confined more. The dog box on the truck. Correct. Yeah. The dog yeah. boxes when you're traveling are, are smaller smaller compartments, and they're, they're, it's not cruel to the dog. It's there for a reason. Number one, you only have so much room. Number two, I think it's important that the dog is confined to a two-by-two two space. If you have a wreck or something... And there has been yeah. dog trucks that have had wrecks. It's almost like having a seatbelt on. For yeah, the dogs. yeah, you have they to have a safe compartment when you're moving. Around. Yeah, yeah. But the the consequences of traveling a lot and having them live out of that dog box is they're in those confined spots, so they don't stretch as much, and I think yeah. they have more prolonging stiffness and yeah. injuries that show up uh, that normally would just go away from exercising on a, on a chain yeah. with the house. So you're saying when you put, come back from a run, rather than putting the dog in an airline kennel, they get to go back out to their spot and stretch around. And we don't talk about that with dogs much, but stretching before runs and cool down and warm up periods. Correct. And I believe after the runs is more that, important than anything. Yep. You know, the yep. uh, muscles, uh, human beings do the same thing. Yep. If you just 
if you go and you out, go out and run uh, ten miles and you go home and you sit in the chair and you don't do anything, you know, uh, You're pretty sore the next day. Yeah, when yeah. you get up out of the chair, you go, oh my yeah. god, you know, this hurts. Yeah. So. And so I, I'm going to say why you're one of my favorite mushers. <laughs> <laughs> Not only because I like you, but you did something that uh, takes a lot of guts, pretty unique. I've always felt that the further you go into the race before you take the mandatory 24-hour rest. In other words, many mushers take a mandatory quarter of the way or a third of the way through the race. You've pushed it halfway to the Yukon River. So tell us about it. And you, you had an unbelievable success doing that. Well, yeah, back in 2006, I, I took my 24 hour rest in Galena, which was a great spot to take. Which it. is a village on the Yukon River. Halfway up the Yukon River. Yeah, it was, uh, it was 50 miles after we hit the river at Ruby. And then I went to Galena and took uh, my 24 hour rest there. And I had 15 dogs when I took my 24 hour rest. So it wasn't like I had a small team, but they rejuvenated so well. And, uh, Basically, when I left there, I just started passing teams like they were standing still. It was one of the funnest runs I've ever had. I ended up finishing third at the finish line, but I was within 59 minutes of second place, who was Doug Swingley at that time, who had beat me all the time. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, was, it was an extremely fun thing to do, even just placing third. Uh, it was just uh, to watch that team lope up the coast was so much more fun than watching them march up the coast. Yeah, it was actually really bizarre. I mean, nobody could have predicted. You left Galena like in, what, 20th place? Something yeah, like I think that. it was 17th or 18th spot. And yeah. uh, Doug Swingley and Jeff King had left 12 hours before I got off of my 24. And me and Doug are pretty good friends, but he was always a little cocky to me. And he, <laughs> he comes over and he tells me, he says, well, we won't be seeing you again. I caught up to him in Koyak, and he was scrambling to stay ahead of me, so it was pretty fun. <laughs> That's good. That was good character building for him. Yeah. So do you think we'll see teams doing that this year? Going... It's possible. Yeah. Um, I think there's teams that are set up for that. Because yeah. of our food drops, yeah. you have to set yourself up for that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I am set up to go into the river and yeah. take my 24. You have to have enough food sent out yeah. to do that. Yeah. And you have to also, kind of like I did that year, you have to have enough food for a full team because you don't know if you're going to get there with 16 dogs yeah, or if you're going to yeah. get there with 10 you know so it takes it, a lot of food to 24 it, with 16 dogs it takes a little preparation it takes faith in your team that they can go that far yeah. uh, i think the biggest thing is you got to i am a firm believer i don't have a set plan that i'm going to stick to no yeah. matter what i watch my dogs and if i feel i can get as far as as the river before i take my 24 and not tire them out too much I'll go for it, you know, because yeah. I, I think it benefits them. The farther you go, the more energy they'll have for the end of the race. So let's talk about those food drops. Um, you have already sent those out about two weeks ago. All that food is waiting at checkpoints along the trail. Correct. How much food did you send out? Do you remember what the total was? Mine was uh, just shy of 2,200 pounds. Okay, and that's almost all food. There's also there's, booties, there's gloves, there's a few right, things like my, that. My but, personal bags <clears throat> probably came up to a total of 300 pounds for myself, yeah. my food, and all my other gear. So that's 1,900 pounds of food for dog 16 food. dogs for right. nine days out there on the trail. How much do you think they can eat at once? Like I remember I it, carried 60 pounds to old woman one time and 12 dogs ate it, it was yeah. gone. <laughs> it's amazing what they can consume yeah. and not get sick and actually use it. Um, that year that I went to Galena, which is yeah. a long ways down the room, I had 15 dogs. Yeah. I fed over 180 pounds of dog food to them dogs, to, six, to 15 dogs in a period of 24 hours. Yeah, we're talking so, 180 pounds of dog food yeah. in less than a day. And yep. it's and, amazing and so, what they can eat at that so point. So when you talk about dog food too, let's, bracket this what does that consist of what are you well, feeding them for each time i feed the dogs i have a dry meal of commercial food yeah. which is high quality commercial food you know we didn't we yeah. don't feed cheap stuff to them it's high protein high fat and then we have probably i think the majority of the mushers have probably about four or five types of meat sent out which we go anywhere if you can get beaver beavers high in fat and protein we send out horse if you can get horse uh, it's high in hemoglobin and protein we send out beef, obviously, that's one of our mainstays. Beef fat for the fat content because, you know, the dogs burn up a lot of fat when they're running. Uh, we, we send out lamb if you can get it. Uh, we send out tripe, which is the uh, stomach linings of the animals, washed and unwashed, both. Those dogs like it. Send out, some people send out liver, you know, some, and then a ton of fish, a ton of salmon. Um, Especially living in Alaska, everybody yeah. has pretty good access to salmon, and salmon 
really, really helps the dogs a lot. They stay hydrated on it. They love it. They never turn their nose away at it. Uh, so we kind of combine all that as we feed. Whatever they want, they get. So. So I know one concern this year is the weather. Several guys have been here can't even keep their food frozen just for the couple days that they're in town. So the food drops along the trail, especially on the southern end, likely have been compromised. There's no freezing mechanism out there. So this meat that was shipped out ahead of time likely has thawed. Yeah, I'm not sure when it actually landed at yeah, the checkpoints. Yeah. And I know that the, the committee has taken great steps uh, yep. in in trying to keep it frozen as much as they can. They cover it with reflective tarps now. Yeah, yeah. Um, put snow around the edges of it, you know, and, and combine it A big it mass of meat will stay cold in the middle too. Right. Yeah. But yeah. I'm, there's no doubt in my mind we're gonna run into bags that are gonna have been thawed out and refroze or are still thawed out. Yeah. And if that's the case, that's another reason we send out a lot of fish because yeah. thawed out fish doesn't tend to spoil Whereas thawed out beef fat, yep. if I get there, if I get to Squintna and there's thawed out beef fat, it ain't going to go with my dogs. I won't <laughs> yeah. take the, ten, the yeah. chance, you know. Got to be pretty picky on that. So I want to have you bring, bring me up to speed. You're in the construction business. I know you build fine homes. You're really detailed on construction. So what are you doing with your sleds this year? Uh, you know, as funny as that may seem and knock on wood, I hope I don't break them. Uh, the sleds I'm sending out, are the same sleds I've used for the last six years. And you built them? And I built them. They're all built out of bamboo, uh, bamboo and aluminum and plastic. And I design them. My design is kind of, I have the Easy Rider design on the back, which I copied kind of from Charlie Bolding, who was one of my favorite mushers. And it, it, uh, it, it causes me, I believe it causes me not to have so much, uh, so much chance of breaking the runners because the runners flex better. There's no back stanchion on them. They just float. And then uh, there's a back units where the brake is attached to that hold up the belly pan. And then obviously, you know, I'm not a spring chicken anymore and we, most of us have gone to the sit down type seats. So my cooler is designed to sit behind me on all of my sleds so I can sit on the top of my cooler and I have my seamstress make me a little pad so it's nice and comfortable. And, <laughs> and uh, that's, that's the kind of sled I use. So from uh, tip to tail, how long is your sled? How much do you have on the trail? Nine feet, maybe, total. And how much, how much weight do you think you're carrying? That will, that will vary from the start of the race to the finish because my sled weighs, starting sled that I'm using is about 47 pounds and I'm sure I will carry, I'll leave the starting line with 60 pounds of dog food in there, plus our mandatory gear and my personal bag, which has all my dog uh, supplies to take care of my dog team, whether it's just if I had to stitch them up, I have a staple gun, I have sutures, I have different types of antibiotics. You know, I can be self-sufficient with my dogs. I have wraps, I have coats, the whole works, plus my own stuff to take care of me and a first aid kit, plenty of sunscreen this year. Um, so probably I'm leaving the starting line with 250 pounds on the runners. Have you had a cold this year? The reason I mention it is because Paul Gebhardt had the worst cold I've ever seen. What was that, 2002? 2000, I, and I actually you, placed you, second that year. So. <laughs> but, uh, so I, am, I do know how to persevere. <laughs> but since that time, and that time I ended up taking uh, some antibiotics that were meant for my dogs, but the... Oh, we can't talk about it. That's, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> but anyways, I used that to try and break the fever that I had, and now I, I do take a Z-Pack with me from the starting line all the time every year so i can take care of myself also. yeah huh. well, thank you for joining us there so i right. wish you the best of luck out there on the trail thank you and uh we're live from anchorage the daily show keep us tuned we're trying to stay on top of it as it happens